nutrition. What should you eat? What should you avoid? What foods are, quote, bad, evil foods? What are the foods that are called superfoods? Most of what I just said is nonsense, but it's confusing. Everyone's trying to get our attention nowadays because that's the real currency, is your attention. What you place your attention on expands, it grows, it strengthens. What you feed grows. Keep that in mind as we talk about this. But today we're gonna to talk about nutrition, but in a different way. This is the lesson that we should all be taught when we're kids. And we should make this a habit throughout our lives because it's something no one really talks about but yet it has a profound effect. And so today, I'm gonna to share a story with you to illustrate what this is and how I really learned it so that you have that experience. And then I'm gonna walk you through why it works, what's the science of it, very briefly. I won't get boring or anything. It will be, exp it will be very exciting. <laughs> and then the final part, I'm gonna teach you the framework to do it yourself. And it's just a little thing you do before you eat that improves your body's ability to absorb, extract the nutrients, and to assimilate them so you can utilize them. So we have all heard the phrase, you are what you eat. And I believed that for a long time because it's true. Your body's constantly breaking down, it's being rebuilt. It's being rebuilt with what you're consuming. But there's something else. And I learned this from the father of functional medicine, Dr. Jeffrey Bland, many years ago. And he says, you are not what you eat. You are what your body can absorb and utilize. And that really got me thinking. And there's a, ser a series of situations, I would say, where I had clients that were, that were struggling. And they appeared to be doing everything right like eating the right amounts of food, the right types of foods, the timing of it. They were and they were consistent, and I believe they were doing it, but their body just was not responding. But these people also had something else in common. They were high achievers. They put a lot of pressure on themselves. They were very hard on themselves. And everyone listen to this. If you're one of my coaching clients and friends, you are one of those people too, because I am. We kind of attract one another, right? And so, it all, the way I really discovered this was I was teaching a second grade class just to give back. I was in my uh, early 20s and I would go into the second grade and usually it was before lunch. Then something changed with the schedule and I started coming after lunch, around 2 p.m. And there was a very different group of people in there. Those kids were not the same kids. <laughs> Something happened after uh, at, in that time between 11 and 2. And the teacher, uh, I still remember her quite clearly, and I remember her telling me that this is just the way it is. It's always been this way. And when she taught other grades, that was similar too. And so I was like, I, I just can't let that be the answer. I need to know more. And so I was like, well, what's the difference? And I would talk to the kids. We would do a little, little exercise programs. I'd teach them about nutrition and about mindset. And, um, and they would tell, like, like, some of the kids after lunch were, like, taking naps. They were out. And other kids were hyper. But there didn't really seem to be too many that were in between, that were calm and centered and ready to learn. <laughs> and so what I decided to do is I, I decided to teach them something called mindful eating. Now, mindful eating, there's books written about this and so forth, but there's no reason to really read a book because I'm going to tell you everything it says. <laughs> it's very simple because you're the type of person that learns, right? You're the type of person that understands meditation. You're the type of person that understands that breath matters. And all these little things really define our experience and the results in our life. And so since you're aware of those, I can teach it very quickly. So. I taught these kids, hey, before you eat, you're, don't be in a rush, because they were all racing to get in the line to get their food, and they were racing to get a seat. They wanted to sit in a certain spot, and then they were racing 
to do all these things. So they were in a very hurried state. And then they only had so much time to eat before they had to go to the next class. And so these kids were stressed. They were afraid they weren't going to get food. That's what they told me. They're like, yeah, if I, if I, if I go to the bathroom first, then I, I, can't, I won't be in line in time. And if I'm not in line in time, I won't get the food that I want. And the chicken nuggets will be out and the pizza will be out. And then I'll have to eat this roast beef or whatever it is. You know, it's like <laughs> this crazy, this funny story. It still makes me laugh. And so they're eating this, this place of stress, of fear. And that's what most people do. Now, before I teach you mindful eating, that's what we'll do at the end, I'll walk you through it. You have to understand the physiology of stress or the physiology of fear. You see, humans have a prefrontal cortex, the part of our brain where we can imagine, we can create things. So we can go in and create a blueprint for, for a goal. Like say you want to paint a room in your house. You can kind of envision the colors on the walls, right? Or you're gonna think about anything you wanna create. Maybe you, you want, if you wanna change your body, you wanna get leaner, you first need to be able to envision yourself, to have that mental picture of what you're going to look like, what you're gonna feel like, what you're gonna be able to do, how life will be different how you'll feel more confident, more certain, if you will, right? But we have that part of the brain where other animals do not. And so here's the thing though, it's a double-edged sword. If you don't take command of it, it goes on default. And the default is that of safety, security, of fear. Because if, if you're fearful, you won't do dumb things, but you also won't make any progress because you're, you're too afraid to go for it. And so this is what happens. If we imagine something happened, say something happened 10 years ago, you were in a car accident or you fell or something like that, and it, it, it was very stressful, very painful, and it made your life miserable for a period of time, right? And just, just imagine that. You don't have to if you don't want to, but just, Play with me for a second. Our imagination will create the same biochemical response, the same hormonal cascading effect as if it just happened again. That's what a trauma loop is. You keep replaying the same pattern again and again and again. But since the brain doesn't know the difference between something imagined and something real, it will have the same biochemical response. And when we're in fear, we're not designed to be in fear. We're not designed to live in stress chronically all the time. We're designed to get to safety, to deal with it. So what, let me give you an example of in the animal kingdom. Let's say you have a zebra and the zebra's hanging out on the savanna, eating some fresh grass, living the life. What's happening? Well, what's happening is this zebra is calm. It's centered, it's not in fear, it's not in stress. And so what's happening is all the blood flow is going to the digestive tract in the organs. The body's producing hormones that are regenerative, that rebuild the body. So it's in this super healing state, we could call it. But as cells break down, they're being replaced. Now, all of a sudden, the zebra catches a scent of something. Ears go forward hear something and then in the distance coming very quickly dust and they can see in the dust a pride of lions bearing down full speed all of a sudden in a moment the all the five senses woof, take that information run it through a part of the brain called the amygdala and it says this is a threat code red blood flow no longer by the digestive tract and the organs, it is shunted to the extremities, to the legs in this case, so they can fight or flight. They're lions, so you flight, they're running. So all their resources are redirected from healing and rebuilding and rejuvenating to survival. And so you, all that blood flow is going to the muscles now so you can get the heck out of there. Hormones, now stress hormones are being produced. Epinephrine, noradrenaline, cortisol and then let's say lucky day zebra gets away awesome so what happens zebra immediately shifts back 
into that calm centered state because they don't have that part of the brain to even think about that. They'll remember it, so they'll be primed for it. But what they don't do, that humans do, is they don't go tell everybody about it. They don't keep telling the story again and again and again and reliving it. And that, we gotta admit, as humans, we do that. People post it on social media, like every problem they have, every dramatic, they're creating all this drama. And drama is just a fancy word for stress. And stress is just another fancy word for fear. So you have two types of emotions, that's it. If you wanna categorize them simply. You have love-based emotions. Love-based emotions regenerate your body. They generate energy. No one has ever said, man, I feel so grateful. Man, I could really, I really need to take a nap. Oh, I have no energy. Number one like, man, I feel so joyful. I'm so tired. I'm so fatigued. No one ever says that. Because when you're in love-based emotional states, you literally generate energy. Now, the other emotional states are fear-based emotional states. Now, fear does not exist. Fear is a, fear is not a thing. I should say it that way. Fear is not a thing. Fear is a lack of something and it is a lack of love. It's a lack of energy. It's a low energy state. And so it drains you. Love-based emotions pump you up. They generate energy. Fear-based emotional states drain you. They require more energy than they put out. And so when someone's in stress, they're in fear, even if it's like, I'm in a hurry, or I don't have that much time, or it's like, oh, if I don't get this done, then this is gonna, oh, they're gonna be so mad. Oh, I'm gonna be so mad if I don't get this done today. I need to check everything off my list. Whatever it is, all those little things, driving in traffic, getting angry, all these negative emotional states, all these fear-based emotional states rob you of energy, and it creates poor digestion and absorption because that blood flow, your resources, your energy is being redirected when you're thinking of these things, when you're in these fear-based emotional states, these stressful states, the blood flow is going to the extremities. It's moving away from the digestive tract. Think of that. So when I taught these little kids how to just do this, now I'm teaching children, which was way easier than adults, by the way. <laughs> they, <laughs> they, they would appreciate that they didn't have to do math. So they were really excited I was there. And so they, I, this is all I told them. I said, hey, before you eat, get your food. You can rush up there if you want, but when you sit down, just take a moment and breathe. Close your eyes. Let, when you close your eyes, less information comes in so you can calm down faster. That's the reason for that. And then put your hands on your tummy and let your belly get big. Then exhale and let your belly get small. So your belly's going out, belly's going in. That's how we're designed to breathe, to calm the body. If you ever watch a baby breathe, their chest and their torso, like their collarbone, it doesn't move when they breathe. They haven't learned to suck in their gut yet. <laughs> That's an adult thing. So their belly is the only thing that moves. And so what happens when you do belly breathing or deep diaphragmatic breathing, you have calming receptors in the lower lobes of the lungs, which is emphasized when you breathe with your belly. In the upper, think of how genius this part is, right? In the upper lobes of the lungs, you have stress receptors, fear receptors, fight or flight receptors. So if there's danger, you know what to do. So let's say you're out, this is back in the day, and you're out picking berries, it's that time of year. All of a sudden you turn the corner and there's a giant grizzly bear right there face to face and it has two cubs. What, what do you do? You go, <gasps> right? You take that short breath where your chest, your collarbone goes up, activating the upper lobes of the lungs, going to fight or flight so you have the best chance of success in that situation, right? But if you're eating that time, it's not a good time to eat. So if you ever notice when an animal's being chased, or even if someone's really stressed, really fearful, like they have to go on st stage for public speaking. I had an actor, he was, he's a legend by the way, uh, and uh, he, this is, he was doing it at the time, man, he was acting for decades, probably 40, 50 years, because I didn't know who he was, but my parents, my grandparents knew who he was. And, um, and he would throw up 
every, right before he went on stage, every time because he was so nervous. He would get in such fear and he would, he would say, like, oh, what if I mess up? What if I forget my lines? Oh, what if I'm just not there? What if it's not my best performance ever? Those are not great questions to ask. Those are not great stories to tell yourself. He could have just easily borrowed from his past victories, right? But that's really another subject, but it kind of fits in here. But what he was doing was he was giving into this fear response. And if it's it, all your resources, when you feel like you're threatened, your resources are diverted, just like I said. So if there's no blood flow around the digestive tract and there's food in there, a lot of times it will expel it. Sometimes it goes upstairs, sometimes it goes downstairs, whatever it is. If it's gonna slow you down and reduce your risk of survival, it's going out. But think of this, this is the way the body works. And so we can use this for good, for our benefit. And so mindful eating is about bringing it back. So all we had we, these children do were to take a moment, close their eyes, take some big belly breaths and put a smile on their face. After they took three belly breaths, they put one hand on their belly, one hand on their heart, like in the middle of their chest, that's where the thymus gland is too, which plays a role in your will to survive. It's your immune function. And the, the thing was, they wanted to count their, I wanted them to count their blessings, like, what are three, take three breaths, and with each breath, think of something you're really grateful for. And their answers were so beautiful. They was always say their parents, they said their pets, they said their teacher, their school, their shoes, their legs, their fingers, like all these things. There's a kid that had a broken arm, and they're like, oh, I'm glad my arm works, and I wish his would work too. It's like, they were just sweet kids. And that's all they did. And then they would eat, and I said, when you eat, remain present. Don't get all wound up. You can laugh, you can have fun, don't get in that state where you feel like you have to hurry. Let your food digest. It's like a sponge. Just let the food go in and stay calm. Let the body do its work. Extract those nutrients and utilize them. Rebuild new cells. Have this beautiful, healthy, healing, rejuvenating response. But you've got to be in this calm, centered state or state of joy or appreciation. Some sort of love-based emotional state. That's it. And again, we'll walk through this, but that is the overall, that's the science of it. So how do you do this? What's the framework? Well, first, declare your intention. Like, hey, I'm intending to enjoy this food and rejuvenate my body. I'm intending to have energy when I'm done so that I can be my best, feel my best, and give my best to those I love, appreciate, and serve. Close your eyes, put both hands on your tummy, your belly, whatever you want to call it, and then make it big. Inhale, ideally through your nose, and you can exhale out your nose or your mouth, whatever seems more natural, and put like an inner smile on your face. Now I do this everywhere, I don't care. If I'm on the plane, um, if I'm at a restaurant, if I'm at home, I don't care who's around me. I just don't care what people think. But if you do, and I understand, you'd be in a business meeting or some people you don't know that well, you know, that would be, this would be kind of weird. So you can do it discreetly and you keep your eyes open and just look at your food and put a little smile on your face, a little appreciation. And then if you can, you can cross your ankles, which will help create a whole brain state. I won't go into the explanation right now, I'll keep this brief. And then place one hand on your heart, one on your tummy, take three more breaths, and just affirm. You wanna tell the story, like this food is fuel. I give blessings and thanks for all those who helped get it here. All the people, all the animals, all the plants, the sun, the soil, the rain, all these things, and just create that. And think of what a miracle it is. And by doing so, it shifts your state, right? And then from that place, strive to just be. Let go and eat. Take a bite, put your fork down. Don't shovel it in. By the way, I'm, I, I've, it took me a long time to learn this. <laughs> I shovel it in. I don't do it now, but that's what I, I've done it so long, I'll still catch myself at times. So it's not about being perfect, it's about making progress. And so this could take less than a minute. 
and then just be as you eat. But I would schedule your meals while you're learning this skill. And just schedule 20 minutes, that's what the science shows, and it may only take you 10 minutes or 15 minutes, but that way you don't feel rushed, because that rush is fear. That's what it is. You can call it stress, you can call it whatever you want, but it is what it is, it's having the same biochemical response. So if you want to have more energy, if you want to absorb, extract, and utilize more of the nutrients you do consume, this is how you do it. So take, again, just the framework, you might want to write this down, is declare your intention. Like, I am intending to fuel my body, to rejuvenate it, and have energy so I can be, feel, and give my best to those I love, serve, and appreciate. Close your eyes if you can. Place both hands on your tummy. Make a big belly. Then make it a smaller belly. Make sure your chest isn't raising up. So after you take three belly breaths, place one hand in the center of your chest and continue those belly breaths by placing a hand on your heart and counting your blessings. You can also notice if your chest is rising because this is a motor pattern, it's a habit. And so it may take a little bit, it may take more awareness, more effort at first until you get enough focused repetition in where it's automated. And that goes with all things. And then remain present as you eat. Put your fork down. And the thing the kids told me, which blew my mind, because they were kids, right? I was like, what did you notice? I noticed their behavior changed. They were the way they were earlier in the day before, but now later in the day after they ate. I could tell which kids didn't do it, and I could tell which kids did. But they, some of what they said, the, their answers were really beautiful. One was like, I feel more calm. This little girl told me that, I remember. Sarah was her name. And then I remember all of them said their food tasted better. And uh, what we did when I was teaching this, we grew strawberries in the classroom. And so when we were harvesting them, they got to taste them. And first they would have a bite with just shoveling in, ah, strawberries, yay. And then they, we would do the, little, the mindful uh, eating technique. And then they would do it and they all said it tastes so much better. And so you have a more pleasant experience. There is no downsides in this. It will, and so some people when they say the downsides, it takes me longer to eat now. Well, yeah, but you're gonna have more energy too. So you actually get back more productivity as a result. So this is the process of mindful eating. And if you ever notice people go on the same diet and they're doing the same exercise or doing the same things and some people get incredible results and some people get average results and some people actually go the complete other direction. A lot of times this plays a role in that because mindful eating also controls your appetite so you don't overeat and you don't undereat. It's also sometimes called intuitive eating or conscious eating. So the number one role in nutrition, people can argue this or anything, but this is a law in physics, the first law of thermodynamics, the amount of energy you consume. That is the number one nutrition principle. You can eat the best foods in the world, but if you overeat them, they still get stored. If you undereat and eat too little, you lose muscle and slow your metabolic rate. And so there's a sweet spot. There's this middle ground, and that's the big mistake people make. A lot of times they're eating the right things, but they're not eating the right amounts. And so rather than getting all caught up in these things and having stress make you overeat, become an emotional eater, this is how you reverse the effects of emotional eating and stress eating. This is the first step, and it is a skill. You won't be perfect at it at first, maybe never, but you will get very good at it quickly. But it's got to be something that is important to you. And I hope I did a good enough job explaining this to you and how powerful this is and how rare it is, how few people actually even know how this works. But now you are equipped and you are the type of person that will take action. And for that, I commend you, my friends. Remember, you are lions, not lambs. Let's do this. tap into the real you but you have to retrain yourself the way you retrain yourself is you wake your ass up in the morning and you say i am here for a reason and a purpose it's bigger than my moods 
It's bigger than the difficulties of the day. I am here to live like a lion, not the fear of a lamb.